Well, good morning. It is so wonderful to have all of you here today. Welcome to Asylum Hill Congregational Church, an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ. My name is Reverend Jordan Busey, and I am your minister for early life. It is always so amazing to see everyone here. And welcome to everyone who is joining us via live stream or participating in this worship service by watching the recording later in the week. Just in case you don't know, we post all of our services on our YouTube channel and you can even subscribe to that channel so that you get a notification every time we post a new video so that you don't miss anything. Friends, we also invite you to visit our website, ahcc.org, where you can find out about upcoming events. You can also sign in. Now, in the past, many churches would have pew pads in the pew so that you could sign in. You can do this on our website. We want to know who you are. We want to know that you are here or you are connecting online. We want to know you so that we can be a better community. While you're on the website, there's also a place to send in a prayer request. We, as your pastors, want to ensure that we know what's going on in your life. Whether it is a joy that you want to share with us or a concern, something that is maybe heavy on your heart, please send in a prayer request so that we can serve you better. So a big thank you. I'm going to say a big thank you to everyone who participated in last weekend's Boar's Head and Yule Log Festival. There's always this funny moment the Sunday after Boar's Head where you look around. It's a beautiful sanctuary, but it just seems if you were here last week and you know all the decorations, it always just seems a little empty. It seems a little empty, but still beautiful. But thank you to everyone who was either in the performance, who helped make it all happen, baked cookies, who came to witness this performance. Thank you, thank you, thank you for making it all happen. Friends, today at 12 noon, we are going to serve another free weekly community meal. As you know, we serve 150 meals to our neighbors each week. If you would like to volunteer, you can just stay after worship, head to the kitchen and get put to work, or you can reach out to Sonia, or the front office, we're always in need of donations, bottled water, individually packaged snacks, or the funds for us to purchase the food. So if you would like more information, check out the website or reach out to the front office. At this time, I would like to invite Jack Pot to come up and make an announcement for us. Good morning. Uh, wanted to, speaking of the Boar's Head Festival, there is a lost and found table in Drew Hall that is specifically related to last weekend. There are various cookie tins and individual gloves and hats um, and articles of clothing. So if you, would, uh, if you think you may have left something here last weekend, that's where it would be. I also want to call to your attention the Arts and Spirituality Retreat, which was coming up in the first weekend of February. Um, there's information about that on our website, but registration for that is open, and we hope that you will uh, encourage your friends and neighbors, and then also yourself, to take a look at the uh, offerings that are happening this year with that retreat. It's a Friday night. Uh, and then uh, most of the day on Saturday, wonderful classes and sessions being offered, and it's always a great time. So Arts and Spirituality Retreat, first weekend in February. Look at our website for more information. Thank you. Friends, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for coming exactly as you are. Whether you woke up this morning totally ready for the day, or it took a few moments to muster up the energy to actually get out of bed, you are here. And we are so thankful for that. 
So in this moment, let us take a deep breath. Relax your shoulders. And let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Please rise and join us in the responsive call to worship and invocation. Since the beginning, God has been relentlessly pursuing us in love. Though our faithfulness ebbs and flows, God's love endures forever. Taking on flesh like ours, God became one with humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. God lived and moved and ministered in the margins of power. God incarnate was not what we expected. We did not recognize God in Jesus, and we sometimes still struggle to recognize God with and around us. And yet, God continues to dwell in our midst Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, let us now turn to our neighbors and pass the peace of Christ. And now let us pray. God of our ancestors and of our prophets, 
We come to you today with so many things on our hearts. We know that you created this world as an act of love and created each and every one of us in your own image. We ask that you be with us and hear our prayers, not as a passive observer, but as a loving parent who only wants the best for us. We pray on this day for our community and especially for prayers of strength and healing for Mary Jean Jones. Surround her and her family and friends with your loving arms. We also celebrate the wedding of Daniela and Jeremy Claflin, who were married this past weekend, surrounded by their family and friends in Mexico. And God, we're thankful for the beautiful flowers today, given by Marcy Senior in memory of Bob Senior and Jerry and Kathleen Sullivan. May their memory be a blessing to us all. God of co-creation, we pray for those of us who are embarking on new beginnings this year and feel like maybe even half a month in, we don't really know what we're doing. May you show us how to sit for a few moments every day, remembering that whatever it is we're about to do, we were told by you that we aren't doing any of it alone. Help us see that the process is important, not just the successes, and that peace is just as powerful as progress. Empower us to see new opportunities and possibilities, not just in the places we are planning for them to be, but also in the places where we might allow space for things to be brought to the surface as you see fit for us. And God, we pray for those of us who are still daring to dream right now. May our visions of the future nudge us lovingly toward making better choices and kinder responses to when we and the other people around us mess up. And God, show us how to connect our hopes for the world down the road with our feet in this moment so that we can move toward the places you are calling us to go. Show us where you need us. Gracious and loving God, be with us as we try to make sense of this world and empower us to be the people you created us to be. We ask that you once again would descend on us with your spirit of unity, peace, and love. We know that you are with us, even to the ends of the earth. And we thank you for sending us your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So quick little story. One of my clergy colleague friends who also serves a UCC church in Connecticut attended Boar's Head last week. And after the show was over, she texted me and said, it was beautiful, and it just occurred to me that while the rest of the world rests after Christmas, you all keep going. <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I'm going to tell you something else. Even after Boar's Head, the Sunday after today, there's still going to be tons of people in the sanctuary. That's a testament to who you are. Because we know, it's not that we shouldn't rest, please take time to rest, but it's that we know there is still work to be done, there's community to be a part of, and I am so honored to be a pastor of a church like that, that other people recognize how much we do. I'm really proud of you all. In this time, each week when we give the offering, it's not something we just do out of habit. 
it's actually a testament to what we believe in. We believe that this community is doing good things in the world through community meals, through our programming, through things like the Boar's Head. Thank you for being a part of this. In this time, let us give back to God a small portion of what has already so graciously been given to us.
Gracious God, thank you for this day and this opportunity to be a part of community and be a part of a group of people who are trying to bring about your kingdom here on earth. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. So John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean region and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, be with us as we try to make sense of your word so that we can be more loving people. Amen. So many of you know that I hurt my ankle pretty badly back in October, and after wearing this fabulous boot on my foot for the past three months, on Thursday, I went in for an MRI. Now, I was excited to finally be getting some answers about what's really going on inside, but also very, very nervous. And I will tell you, I was not nervous for the reasons you might be thinking. No, I am what some might call a red flag patient. Which means those questions um, that they ask you at the beginning of a doctor's visit or on an intake form where you have to answer no or yes, and yes means you have to give more information, I answer yes to most of the questions. Are you allergic to any medications? Yes. What are they? Ooh. How much space do you have on that piece of paper? Because it's a lot. Things like that. But friends, when it comes to radiology appointments, my red flag patient status really comes into full view. So the MRI tech asked me this. Do you have any metal in your body? Yes, two screws in my spine. Do you have any piercings? Yes. Do you have any tattoos? <laughs> yes. How many? Like 40. <laughs> when was the last time you were tattooed? Six months ago, a year ago? September. The interrogation goes on like this for several minutes. So each and every time the tech or doctor goes through this litany of questions, I keep praying for it to be over. Hoping that my red flags haven't blocked me from getting the test or scan done that day. So this past Thursday, I could tell we were getting close to the end and I was about to cross the finish line into the exam room and the MRI tech said, wait, I just have one more question. <laughs> yes. Is that a Stanley? <laughs> she pointed at this cup. 
This water bottle that has become basically another appendage for me, or my emotional support water, depending on who you ask, was right next to me. I smiled and said yes, and exhaled a huge sigh of relief as this sweet mom asked me to explain all of this so that she could understand her 14-year-old daughter better, who hasn't stopped asking for one of these. Because friends, if you have millennials or teenage girls in your life, or have been watching the news recently, you know what a Stanley is. For the past few years, these cups have dominated social media, and within the past few months, they have become the hottest accessory for young girls. With the hashtag Stanley currently sitting at 7.1 billion views on TikTok, Stanley cups, or more specifically Stanley quenchers, are thermoses made from stainless steel built in a way that is meant to keep the temperature of your drink cold for up to 11 hours or hot for up to seven hours. One woman even reported in a video on social media that after her car caught on fire, the only thing that survived was her Stanley Cup and that after the whole ordeal was over, it still had ice in it. Now, the Stanley Company itself has existed since 1913, with its founder, American physicist, William Stanley Jr.'s patented flask famously being used by pilots during the Second World War pictured up here on the left. Up until recently, the brand's target demographic has been adventurous people who need durable items for outdoor-related activities, blue-collared workers, and mainly men. But this has since drastically changed with its increasing popularity among millennials, Gen Z, and especially Gen Alpha girls, leading the brand to replace many of its camouflage or dark colored tumblers with soft pastels and glittery options, as pictured here on the right. You can now even buy accessories for your Stanleys, as pictured here. Now listen. <laughs> While I myself own several of these brightly colored 40 ounce water bottles and several more Stanley coffee tumblers, I haven't yet to dive deeper into the accessory world, but don't tempt me because that snack topper looks like the smartest thing I have ever seen. So even if you don't have teenage girls in your life, the reason why you might recognize these cups is because you may have seen them on the news recently. Target dropped a limited edition Valentine's Day collection in collaboration with Starbucks, featuring tumblers in pink and red. The launch was a huge success, completely selling out with no plans to restock. In fact, the collection was so successful that it had people fighting over the cups and pulling all-nighters to make sure that they were first in line at the stores. Videos and images have flooded my newsfeed this past week, and I would assume that you have seen them as well. Now, quick note, you can say whatever you want about silly trends or capitalistic consumerism, but I will defend this Stanley Cup movement until my dying breath. <laughs> because, unfortunately, and this deserves a longer analysis that we just don't have time for this morning, but more often than not, Girls tend to be the ones accused of being silly at best or crazy at worst, 
when they really love something. Think Beatlemania or teenage girls crying at a Taylor Swift concert. Crazy, right? And yet, throughout my life, I have seen plenty of videos of boys and men standing in line at the crack of dawn to secure the newest PlayStation console or game or seen grown men rioting in the streets over a loss or win, all in the name of love for their team. We don't call them crazy. We call them passionate. This double standard really bothers me, and I invite you to just be very careful about how you talk about this Stanley trend or other crazy things in front of young girls and boys. But friends, for our purposes today, I will say that since buying uh, these Stanley Cups, I've never been more hydrated in my whole life. Believe me, I've always been a good water drinker. Over the past few months, with one of these in my hand, or in my car, or at my desk, literally never felt better, minus this whole foot injury thing. Because friends, water is necessary. Water is life. Consuming water is essential to us being able to be humans. We know that scientifically we are made of mostly water. The earth needs water. And even in our faith, we know the importance and significance of water as necessary to the creation of the universe and the item needed in the sacrament in which we literally come into our full belovedness as children of God. Water matters to bodies, to the earth and Christianity itself. Today, on the first Sunday after Epiphany, we as a church, it's Big C, mark and celebrate the baptism of Christ. Now, it is probably one of the more obscure or awkward church holidays. I mean, we literally just celebrated Jesus' birth. God's incarnation as a little baby a few weeks ago, and now suddenly he's a full-grown adult and getting baptized by his cousin. It's a little jarring, but actually the perfect place for us to be at this moment in time. It is such an important story that all four Gospels tell it in one way or another before Jesus does anything as a teacher and healer, he hikes up his robes, scrambles down the muddy riverbank, and wades into the Jordan River to be baptized by John. The ancient rite of baptism was a moment when you acknowledge that water is vital to all forms of life, and the new convert surrendered to fully living into the promise that no matter what happened, God was with you. In many first century Jewish sects, including the one led by John, the pathway into any life of serious religious discipline leads through water. As the Israelites of old passed through the Red Sea, so any serious believer must do the same. Getting in the water is a choice, and that means something important. When you say that you want to be a part of a faith community, you have to symbolize your entrance into a new life. And water is the perfect thing to use, because again, water is life. And while our modern acts of baptism look pretty different from the original immersions, we still retain the two most important elements. Two, water and 
community. Because if you read any of the baptism stories, you see that you can't do baptism by yourself. There has to be another person there or a room full of people. But it's a big deal, and getting wet can be a little uncomfortable, or getting into the water has its risks. Wading into water, especially in ancient baptism, can be this gorgeous mixture of joy and fear. Think a little kid who's jumping off the diving board for the first time. Exciting and scary. It's true for baptism and, frankly, most important things we do in life. Now, I'm not a big fan of swimming. You may remember my confession to you all last year on Baptism of Christ Sunday. I don't like the beach. I don't like large bodies of water. I'm more of a dry land kind of person. And honestly, I don't even want to think about what chlorine would do to this hair. But I still loved going to the pool as a kid. Many of us have childhood memories of going to the pool. Whether it was with family or friends, a community pool, or in your neighbor's backyard, most Americans, at one point or another, have swam or played in a swimming pool. In the 20th century, in an effort to increase recreational opportunities for their citizens, many communities in the United States created pools for children and adults to swim and splash in. However, in the beginning, Few of these spaces welcomed people of color. Segregation was the law throughout the South when these pools started popping up. And though northern cities often didn't have Jim Crow statutes on the books, discriminatory behavior still took place there, here, as well. Segregation at pools was sometimes enforced by intimidation and violence, such as beating anyone who tried to even go in the water. And because of this racist discrimination in the 50s and 60s, like buses and lunch counters, swimming pools became a place of protest during the fight for civil rights. For instance, in 1964, a group of black and white people jumped into a segregated pool at a motel in St. Augustine, Florida, as an act of civil disobedience. This enraged the manager so much that he began pouring acid and bleach into the water that they were swimming in. So while the Civil Rights Act of 1964 put an end to sanctioned separation of different races in public areas, many white people continued to oppose desegregation, including at pools. And by 1969, pools around the country were still shutting out people of color. Enter to the scene two real American heroes who found a way to fight this racist reality by lovingly and calmly modeling to all of us why access to water is at its core a justice issue and a religious imperative. On May 9th, 1969, Episode 1605 of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood aired across the United States. Fred Rogers, one of my personal patron saints, knew that pools continued to refuse entry to people of color and that racial tensions were rising. Martin Luther King Jr. had just been assassinated the year before. So Rogers wanted to send a deliberate message to the world, particularly to children. 
pretty common knowledge that he often addressed problems many children face in their lives. Mr. Rogers made a conscious choice to never shy away from the realities of the world. As an ordained minister, he felt an obligation to be gentle, kind, and honest with the children who trusted him. So, on May 9th, 1969, in front of his viewers across the nation, Mr. Rogers asked Officer Clemens, a black officer in the neighborhood, played by Francois Clemens, if he'd like to cool his feet with him in a children's wading pool. Clemens initially declines the invitation, noting that he doesn't have a towel. But Mr. Rogers replies that Clemens can share his. The actions in episode 1065 weren't really complex, but they were powerful. Two men took off their shoes and socks, rolled up their pants, and then swished their feet together in a shallow pool on a hot day. But Rogers and Clemens demonstrated that a black man and a white man could lovingly and peacefully share the water. When Clemens, a few minutes later, had to go, he used Mr. Rogers' towel to dry his feet as promised. Then Rogers left the pool directly after him and proceeded to use the same towel. Their casual intimacy exposes in a striking way the bigotry of denying black citizens access to pools or any other place in society. Now this whole thing is amazing. My favorite moment, if you've never watched this clip, Go home today and watch this clip. My favorite moment of this scene is actually what Fred Rogers says to Officer Clemens as he's toweling off his feet. He says, I know how busy you are, but sometimes just a minute like this will really make a difference. I know how busy you are, but sometimes just a minute like this will really make a difference. In May of 2020, Francois Clemens released his memoir entitled Officer Clemens. In it, he lovingly refers to Fred Rogers as his spiritual soulmate. Clemens also talks in detail about that infamous 1969 swimming pool moment as well as his last appearance on the show in 1993. In that final episode, he and Rogers recreated the pool scene pictured here. But this time, Clemens didn't just use Mr. Rogers' towel. Mr. Rogers took the towel and physically dried Clemens' feet for him. Clemens, who saw a connection to Jesus wa washing his disciples' feet, found this act so moving. As he later writes in his book, I am a black gay man, and Fred Rogers washed my feet. So friends, here's the deal. You might be thinking, I mean, Jordan, this is great, but that's not baptism, right? To which my answer is, yes, it is because water is life. Water, whether it's in a swimming pool or cooling your feet with a friend and sharing a towel or through the sacred sacrament of baptism in a river or sanctuary, we know that water is powerful. But water is powerful because it has the power to invite us into seeing ourselves and our neighbors the way God sees us. And remember, it's not just water. The other element needed for baptism is community. We need other people to help us. Even Jesus couldn't baptize 
himself. He needed another person. That's actually my favorite detail of this baptism story. And the same is true for us. It's okay to need other people. It's how we were designed. And it's reinforced to us in the gospel story today. Even the Son of God needed other people. Friends, in church, when we talk about baptism, the correct phrase to say is not, I was baptized. It's, I am baptized. Because the baptism of Christ, and therefore each of our personal experiences of baptism, is not just an act that happened to us. It's an entrance into a new way of life. You are baptized every day. You are baptized no matter what you do. Nothing in this world can take away your status as a child of God. We remember our baptisms every time we are reminded that God loves us and we acknowledge the importance of water and community. Mr. Rogers and Officer Clemens hoped that their baptismal act would usher in a new way of life for people in our country. Did it fix everything? No. But did it change something? Yes. Will carrying this water everywhere make me like a better, healthier person and fix everything? No. But does it invite me to drink more water each day and therefore make better choices? Yes. On any journey, it's actually the small, intentional choices and acts that change everything. We live in a chaotic and busy world. It's hard to stop and change. Baptism, whether it's your own or when you witness someone else's, is a reminder that where there is water and community, there is life. Slow down. Remember, it's not I was baptized. It's I am baptized. It's a reality that you live into, not something that was done to you. Baptism is something that can never be taken away from you. In this life, more often than not, I have found that the things that really matter, things that people remember about you, are the small, intentional acts and choices. Our invitation today is to take a deep breath. Slow down for a second. Just remember how beloved we are by God. And just like Mr. Rogers said to Officer Clemens, who took just a few moments to be vulnerable and get in the water with him, he might say to us, I know how busy you are, but sometimes just a minute like this will really make a difference. And I think God might say the same thing to us. Remembering our baptisms is a small, intentional way, even just for a minute, where we remember how loved we are. And it can make all the difference. When we know someone loves us, we actually make healthier, better choices. Friends, you are loved by God. Whether there is water, whether you are at home witnessing this today, you are not alone. You are surrounded by this community. Friends, remember your baptism. You're doing a great job, but slow down. I know how busy you are. 
but sometimes just a minute like this will really make a difference. Amen. On Baptism of Christ Sunday, in churches all across the world, people are invited to reaffirm their baptisms. And that can be done in lots of different ways. Sometimes you are reaffirmed by a pastor or priest, um, placing water on your hand or your forehead. But today, we are going to reaffirm our baptisms together. If you are at home, I invite you to either gather some water or go to a sink so that you can have some water as we participate in this moment. Now listen, if you haven't been baptized yet, like officially, you can still come up. I'm not checking. You are welcome no matter what. So here's the thing. The two elements you need, water, and community. After we read our reaffirmation of baptism litany together, anyone who wants to is invited to come forward, to touch the water in the baptismal font. But I ask that you don't do it alone. When you come forward, make sure there's a few people around the baptismal font at the same time. And as you touch the water, I invite you to just look the other people in the eye. I know how busy you are, but sometimes just a minute like this will make all the difference. Let us join together in our reaffirmation of baptism litany. Friends, through the water of baptism, we are brought into the family of God. In this family, we honor our differences and see God in each other. Every one of our neighbors is a glimpse of God from a different angle. God claims each of us with delight, and we claim one another as companions in faith. In our baptismal vows, we promise to love, support, and care for each other, working together to resist injustice and oppression in every form, within us and around us. Today, we remember our baptisms collectively and individually. We know that we swim in the same water as an act of justice. We jump into the pool of baptismal love because everyone belongs. You are a beloved child of God. This water is a sign of joy, acceptance, and belonging. We are beloved. Let us remember so that we can share the joy and love of Christ in everything we do. Amen. You are invited to come forward and reaffirm your baptism in community.
Remembering your baptism is an important thing that we do as a church and individually. Every time you are near water, even washing your hands, taking a shower, please remember that you are loved by God and this community. Let us go out into the world knowing that it wasn't that we were baptized. We are baptized. Amen.